Bangkok, Thailand. And I'm actually on a bit of a quest today. I've got a religious focus. I want to, I want to learn a bit more about the temples and Buddhism. Uh, but I've also seen a few mosques um, and churches around the place. So I'm actually right now I'm opposite uh, the world famous Jay Fai's restaurant. She's one of Michelin star and she was also featured on uh, one of Netflix series, uh, what is it called, Chef's Table. And if you haven't had a chance, be sure to check it out, it's fantastic. There's a pretty fair queue there, so I'm not actually gonna stop at Jay Fire's restaurant uh, for breakfast, for brunch. But instead, I've just found a temple here, and it's kind of got a really unique shape and structure, a lot, a lot of pointy things, so. I'm gonna learn about this one first, that's my first stop. So if you look over my shoulder, you'll see one of the highest pagodas, or the highest pagodas, or chedis in all of Bangkok. So I'm gonna go there second. If you stick with me today, you're gonna to find out a lot more about some of the religious sites here in Bangkok. This temple here is called Wat Ratchanada. Now it is a, it's also nicknamed the, it's also has a nickname as the metal castle. It's the metal spire sticking out of it. Uh, now the name Arachanada actually means the Temple of the Royal Niece and indeed this was built by King Rama III for his granddaughter in 1846. There's 37 metal spires on this temple and the 37 spires represent the 37 virtues that are required to reach enlightenment. 36 meter high metal castle consists of three levels. The bottom level has 24 spires, the middle level 12 spires, and the top has only one, one spire, so that totals 37 spires. There's only two other structures that are the same as this in the world. There's one that was built in India. And there's another one in Sri Lanka as well. And neither of those exist today, so this is a one-of-a-kind temple. So I'm now inside the temple and it's uh, kind of like a maze. I really like it. It's made up of a thousand rooms. Don't even know where I'm going, but I like it. As you can imagine, it's very peaceful in here, very cool. Plenty of pace places for more sitting and meditating. It's great stools for meditation and reflection. Yeah. It's a really unique place. I had no idea from the outside that it was like this. There's a few exhibits, I'll see if I can get some footage of those. So this here outlines the first three kings of the Chakri dynasty. King Rama I, Rama II, and Rama III. Now Rama III was known as the temple builder. So this, uh, uh, this little image here talks about the first three kings and where they tend to have their focus or their affinity. Uh, so with the first, first king, Rama I, his favorites were the warriors. King Rama II, his favorites were the poets. But king Rama III, 
He favoured the construction and the master craftsmen. And it was during his reign that we saw a massive amount of temples being built in Bangkok, including this one where we are today, known as Loa Prasat. It's a really good uh, model, a cross section of Loha Prasad. And you can see down the bottom, this is where I've just been walking around in the maze like area. And you can see the three distinct layers the first, the second, and then the third. So it's a really a remarkable building here. If you're in Bangkok, definitely check it out. second level, the second tier, and it's got just some wonderful Buddha images uh, surrounding this, this area, and there's also a library, there's a lot of books here as well, and it's quite nice, very peaceful once again, uh, they've also got some wise sayings dotted around the place, the moment one does a righteous thing, that moment is auspicious. A mindful person is blessed with good luck at all times. Wise words. Let me tell you about King Rama III. King Rama III, when he passed away, he had 51 children. However, none of them uh, be went on to become king. Uh, his successor was actually his brother. On King Rama III's deathbed, he was quoted to saying, our wars with Burma and Vietnam were over. Only the threat of the Westerners was left to us. We should study their innovations for our own benefits, but not to the degree of obsession or worship. He himself actually did borrow a lot of, uh, study a lot of uh, European uh, education, literature, uh, architecture, and you can see that during his reign that, he, that that influence was quite evident. But he warned of this kind of concept of an obsession. During King Rama III's reign, he, it was actually a very wealthy period of time. Trade with China was on the increase. And, and, and mo what was most peculiar was that the profits that, uh, that the king generated, he actually kept them in a red bag next to his, next to his bed and it was commonly known that was his red purse money. Now, Naklao, that's what uh, King Rama III's name is, Naklao. Naklao stipulated that the red purse money that he earned through his business acumen This is the meditation walk. So it's actually, uh, oh, there's a guy meditating behind me. I'm not going to disturb him. But this is actually a beautiful, uh, yeah, beautiful area for meditation. seated meditation.
um, nearly at the top. And look over there, that's the direction of Kaohsan Road. Just to help you get your bearings. Fantastic view up here. 360 panorama of the city. You can see quite a few landmarks just behind me is the big golden chetty where we're going to go next. Um, you can see the state tower, which is right next to the Chow Praia River. Uh, I can see the giant swing just over there. And just over here, we've got the, the four wing like structures, which is the Democracy Monument, and then a massive bridge in the background. Fantastic here. So the King Rama III, uh, during his reign, he was very prof profitable because of his, uh, his business acumen. And what he did that was kind of unusual was that he kept all of his profits in a red purse next to his bed. And this became kind of known as the red purse money. Now, the aim of this, well, the, the purpose of this red purse money was to be only used to help benefit the people. In particular, if uh, during this time you can uh, you can just uh, trace back to uh, the Dutch, the British, and the French were colonising a lot of uh, different neighbouring countries. Uh, so he wanted to have some money uh, set aside in case he indeed needed to buy back some land uh, that was claimed by one of the colonial powers at the time. And indeed, this did come in handy in a future incident uh, called the Pak Nam incident which uh, involved uh, kind of a conflict with the Siam uh, government, or the, the Siam, with the Siam and with the French. Uh, and there's some lands that were around near the Mekong area and the Laos area. And indeed, some of this red purse money had to be used to actually uh, settle, settle the disagreements uh, to help ease the, to help come to some kind of a resolution, the red, red purse money was indeed used. Okay, now I've just finished here. I'm now going to walk over to Wat Saket. Now Wat Saket is, um, it's basically the only hill in all of Bangkok and it was an artificially made hill. So I want to go over there and learn a little bit more about Wat Saket, this famous, famous, uh, this famous temple here in Bangkok. So let's go. It's got some interesting uh, rock down here in this basement, uh, the, not the basement, the, the, the ground floor, floor level. It's kind of that laterite uh, volcanic rock, uh, which I actually saw a lot of when I was in Buriram recently. 